Welcome to the GTN Show. Lots to discuss this week, including whether running shoes are becoming too cushioned. Yeah, and we round up some of the triathlon industry's April Fools. At least, we think they were April Fools. An attempt at the longest triathlon record and a thrilling indoor triathlon around an athletics track. <laughs> show as we always do with some of the stuff we've noticed on the internet and seen as two days ago it was april fool's day some of the stuff we noticed on the internet was foolish stuff i i almost was caught out by one actually it was the first thing i saw when i opened up and it was only sort of scrolled on to the next i was like ah yeah I had to scroll back and just check again. He says it was actually hours later. He was like, <laughs> yeah, oh, so I probably to, shouldn't have shared that with the whole, that thing. Shouldn't have shared that with the whole WhatsApp group. <laughs> oh, that's awkward. <laughs> anyway, there's this one from Zwift. Uh, and uh, they've got a Zwift avatar wearing VR. It's like VR within VR. Yeah, what do you think the avatar is looking at the real world? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be cool. Inception. Yeah, very Inception, that one. Uh, what's this one? Salomon, Salomon running now and Courtney DeVolta. Have a new running vest. Yeah, they, they seem to have done a little collab on what they call the S Lab Ultra Spark, which includes a carbon toothbrush, um, some dental floss, and various other things that you can wear on your front whilst you do an ultra marathon. And I actually read through the comments, and this was actually the one that fooled me for a moment because I was like, <laughs> I mean, it looks it's quite well to, made. It's like, to reach yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of people also were fooled. Like, hang on. Here's another one that could be real, except for maybe the last line. Outlaw Triathlon, due to the previously advised road improvement scheme, uh, the affecting the bike course at Outlaw Half Nottingham, we have been requested by local highways to use the Regatta Lake Perimeter Road as an alternative route. Oh. The course will now consist of 18 laps of the lake in an anti-clockwise direction. And then the last line, which gives it away, says drafting will be permitted if not positively encouraged, which you would have to do if you were on a I, lake loop 18 times. I, I, I've... <laughs> Been around that lake a few times on the bike, and I would not like to do 18 laps. Yeah, well, I mean, this. looking at the T100 routes, you, it's not that far fetched, is it? Very true. <laughs> uh, moving on, challenge Roth. Um, I've said that swim drafting will be banned, uh, challenge Roth. Um, it said for this reason, there'll be a mandatory distance of 4.5 meters, and to control this, Race Ranger will be deployed when swimming. If someone is caught drafting in the water, the penalty must be served at a specially installed penalty buoy directly in the water. Yeah, out of a duty of care, we will hand out a swimming noodle to anyone who needs it <laughs> while they serve their penalty. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, some people wouldn't complain too much if drafting was banned in the swim. <laughs> Certainly help. Uh, Quintana Roo has released a VPRE, mm -hmm. which is their VPR electric. It says, taking the intimidation out of try, faster with less effort, 28 miles per hour for 112 plus miles equals record times in your next Ironman triathlon. Tempting. Very tempting. <laughs> and um, it's solar powered too, apparently. <laughs> another one from Pro Try News. Um, they've been acquired by Barstool Sports. Um, mm, they wish. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool, <laughs> wouldn't it? I mean, how much do they have to pay Barstool Sports to buy them? <laughs> <laughs> um, and final one, this is quite a cool one from Precision Fuel and Hydration. Um, anyone remember the old Pez dispensers? Well, they've created their own Fez, PH. Pez dispensers. Pez dispensers. Yeah. Pez dispensers. Uh, they did one with uh, Fenella Langridge and they also did another one with uh, Victor Campanarts. Victor Campanarts in the cycling world. So, yeah, and their respective faces on yeah. the, the uh, Pez dispensers. I've actually tried and tested these within a triathlon, actually, and I can say they're, they're, they're pretty good, but um, you don't have to store them down your budgie smugglers oh, as I did. So. Flashbacks. Okay, and one final react thing we spotted on social media, and really not an April Fool's, because this one's very not, not great. No. Um, Emma Pallant's not having a great time. Yeah, she's come off her bike and preparing for Oceanside in between T100 Miami, where she ended up in hospital uh, after a heat stroke. Uh, she's now come off her bike. She's got quite some nasty scrapes, including one on her cheek, which oh, means she must have hit the ground pretty hard. Uh, she is still hoping to start in Oceanside this coming weekend. More about that race coming up later on, but yeah, we wish Emma all the best in re recovering from that crash. Okay, on to Try News, quick bit of Try News actually, but first off, an exciting announcement from us here at GTN, a new partner announcement, because we started working with Kuros Watches. Yeah. 
they are cool. Yeah, really been, we may have seen, if you look closely for the last couple of months, us actually wearing these watches um, in some of the videos. So you've been trying and testing them and they are really good. I've actually got their Pace watch here. And the then, Iliad Kipchoge version in the Kenyan <laughs> colours I like. Yeah, I'm pretty chuffed with mine too. I've got the Apex Pro 2 in Chamonix Mont Blanc colours, which I'm really chuffed with actually. Uh, they actually sponsor quite a few big names and we have a video coming out with one of those big names not too far away on the channel. Watch yeah. out for that. Mark went and ran with someone special. I went around with Killian Journey. <laughs> Once, oh, life complete yeah. moment. Yeah, once Mark stopped shaking and could actually get some words off, they had, a, they had an interview. <laughs> Got rid of the tears. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, also some other notable names if you follow Chorus and some of these athletes. Jakob Ingebrigtsen um, has just recently signed with Chorus. Uh, also Phil Seisman and um, yeah, along with Kipchoge, also the NN elite run team um so yeah pretty impressive. no word yet on when mark's gonna go and run slash race jacob ingebrigtsen but uh we'll work on that also chorus has a really cool training hub and if you haven't checked it out already go check it out because if you use a chorus watch you can upload all your stuff to the training hub and it is completely free for both you and the coach and it is in depth, it is powered by the Koros Evo Lab, and uh, it analyzes all your training data and your general wear data every day. And I've been using it for a while now, and it's it's really in depth. And to get that kind of product for free is quite incredible. So yeah, check that out. Well, you've seen a bit more of those on all of our videos coming up. We've got quite a few things coming up with Koros and their watches. Uh, but yeah, we'll be wearing them every day from now on. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, moving on, uh, a man is trying to beat the world's longest triathlon record. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird triathlon record because he's kind of doing it backwards. He's been running already for eight weeks, run I think 900 miles or so, so far. Uh, the total record distance, 5,940 miles will, will be the new record because the current record is 5,937.2 miles. So he's adding a whole uh, 2.8 miles to that record. <laughs> you kind of feel like you should aim a yeah, little bit go. higher. Keep going a little, make it, <laughs> make it that much harder for someone else to do. Anyway, he's doing 1,155 miles of running, then 4,610 miles of cycling, and then over 175 miles of swimming. So it's, it's yeah. sizable, yeah. It's a, it's a big chunk of time. He's been doing it for eight weeks already, two more weeks of running, and then he gets onto the cycling. Uh, no word on how long that's going to take him just yet but uh yeah it's going to be a while uh, i don't think there's a time goal it's just covering the distance yeah so um, just... i mean yeah as you say it's underway he's already raised over fifteen thousand pounds for the dragonfly cancer trust charity um and yeah if you would like to donate we'll put the just giving link in the description just below this video but yeah keep going there yeah good luck okay we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion now because this is something both of us have been monitoring and kind of aware of and been discussing in the office from time to time running shoes and how big they're getting they, yeah how big they're getting indeed so is there such a thing as too much cushioning because the problem we're finding is that so what happened obviously as we all know the carbon shoe revolution there was a maximalist kind of movement before that where people were going bigger and bigger shoes these big floaty shoes then they put carbon plates in it which stiffened them all up made them racing shoes great brilliant however there are multiple studies lots of studies now that actually show that adding cushioning to your shoe doesn't decrease the impact load of running. In fact, it might even increase the impact load of running. So that seems very counterintuitive. So let's explain a little bit. You, your body compensates for whatever it's feeling. So if it's feeling impact every time you land, your body will soften your knees, soften your hips to absorb that impact so it doesn't go jolting all the way up into your spine. If you put that cushioning underneath your foot, your body no longer needs to do that, so it won't, because your body will do the absolute minimum. And so that impact that was going, being cushioned by your legs, is now not there as much. But it is still there. In fact, because your body thinks that these soft cushioning shoes that it's landing on are so soft that it doesn't need to worry about any impact forces whatsoever, it stiffen up to your, stiffens up to your legs and your hips so much so that the impact forces felt at your feet are actually higher in really cushioned shoes than they are in no cushioned shoes, which is quite profound, especially when you look at the new revolution where all shoes, it seems, 
are at that limit of 40 millimeter stacker height. All of them. Yeah, I mean, this is aside from just even the race shoes are carbon plates. Just general training shoes just seem to be getting bigger and bigger. And people who typically found themselves with sore feet, metatarsal issues, Achilles issues, might be leaning for these shoes right now going, oh yeah, well, it just alleviates those issues. But as James says, the impact is just the same and injuries... But it feels so good when you first put them <laughs> it does, on. yeah. And I'm, I'm there. Like, I've, <laughs> I've noticed it and I'm definitely going for more cushioned shoes. I'm finding myself enjoying them and the ride of them even more. But it's not alleviating any of the injuries and they're still as prevalent as they were before. And I guess where we maybe should talk about this a little bit more is the fact that because their shoes are becoming so cushioned, there's so much support in them as well with the carbon shoes, various things, that are our feet just switching off? Yeah, I mean, I think that is the whole principle is that you switch off all of the cushioning that your body is naturally designed to do yeah. because your body has that cushioning there already. And they've shown in different studies, there's studies that have looked at running surfaces, running on really soft tracks versus running on hard pavement and shown that the impact force is not less on a soft track. Mm. Your body just hits that soft track that much harder to try and get the same response. That's interesting. So, so y you are not actually helping yourself with the soft shoes. And then there's another aspect to it, which we've spoken to about. Uh, we spoke in our The Truth About Carbon Shoes video that we, that we did not too long ago, where the carbon shoes are now putting carbon plates in their shoes that kind of are springs that force you into a certain rock, a certain gait. Uh, and those adaptations are also not something your body is naturally used to. Now, the argument, of course, is that any shoe you can get used to if you just spend enough time doing it and build up to it slowly. And that is true to a certain extent. But if the impact forces are always higher in a soft shoe, you are better off in a less soft shoe for most of your runs. And this is where it gets really difficult because, as Mark says, when you put on those Maximus shoes, and you head out the door, they feel so plush. They feel amazing. But you may actually be doing more harm than good. So where do we go from here? I mean, do we just accept it and our feet just gradually over time get weaker and we evolve to just be a flubbery mess? And, uh... <laughs> I, think this, I think this is interesting. And I think in 10 years' time, we'll all look back and go, whoa. What you know, much like we all look back at the, the barefoot craze where everyone wore vibram five fingers and, and ran in those and we look back and you go whoa but they had strong we feet. went way too far on that side of the pendulum didn't we and now we're going way too far on the other side of the pendulum and in a few years time we're all going to look back and go what were we thinking because i really do think that these are doing more harm than good I and mean, obviously the times are going faster and faster so people are going there's no such thing as a bad shoe if it's making you faster but I think also the injuries are increasing now. I think the long, long-term studies, which we haven't seen yet with these 40 millimeter high shoes, mm. uh, will show increased incidence of stress fractures. Maybe we need, leg maybe we need to etc. find the limit. We need to create some spice. Spice Girl-esque stiletto Paybacks foam shoes that are like 100 mil <laughs> We'll thick. buy two pairs of 40 millimeter and stick them, <laughs> stick on, them on top, top of each other. other. <laughs> and see if we go faster in them, or is that the tipping point? Well, yeah, but we probably will go faster, Mark, until our foot breaks off. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the point. <laughs> that just because you went faster for that one run, it's GTN not does really science. worth you breaking your foot over. It is will it? be for yeah. GTN, though. All right. Well, I'll get the shoes and stick them together, okay. and you do the running in them. Right. How's that for a plan? Well done. Okay. Stay tuned for that video. Okay, now for what's the tech? Uh, just a couple of quick ones today. First off, from Oakley, they have some new helmets, some new clothing, but in particular of interest to us triathletes is the Arrow 7 helmet. Yeah, it's a new helmet with an integrated lens that attaches to the front of the helmet. It's not actually that new. It's more like an updated version mm. of the previous Arrow 7, but it does have the prism lens attached to it in a sleek and low drag design and a magnet system for quick attachment of the lens or detachment of the lens. What interests me about this one is it seems 
so different to the way in which helmets are going in terms of their design and aerodynamics. And um, I mean, it's a nice looking <laughs> helmet, but uh, yeah, is it a nice helmet? It's Oakley getting left behind. Stick to sunglasses. Maybe. maybe. I don't know. Mark, yeah. Mark's, Mark's it's, told it's him. Two cents. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next one uh, from Surpass, our partners here at the channel. Um, they've got a couple of new iterations of their suits. So first off with the Insane suits, their new Insane 2, which is their top of the line suit, which previously had the turbulators on the arms. You'll now notice from the images that mm -hmm. they are now using trip strips, um, yeah. which not only are going across the back, but also on the arms. Yeah, it looks pretty, pretty cool. Waiting to see our GTN version arrive of those. Uh, yeah, slightly deeper neck opening and the panel adjustments on the chest and upper arms to improve the movement and comfort of that suit. I was pretty comfortable already in there. This is a really nice material as well. Yeah. Um, they've also got an update to their Aero suit, which is now the Aero 4, uh, which is at a slightly lower price point. Um, also, very nice looking suit. Yeah, speed suits. Also, does now mean that you can get the previous Insane suit for significantly cheaper. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> deals to be had on the website. <laughs> All right, now it's time for some race news. I mean, there's some exciting racing this past weekend, if you missed it. Uh, the World Triathlon put on a indoor World Cup. Now, this is not to be confused with next week's Super Tri E Arena Games. Uh, they are both indoors, they are both in an arena. However, they are slightly different in that the World Triathlon Indoor Cup actually happens on your bike and running around an indoor track. So there's no virtual Zwift or treadmills or turbos in sight. You actually swim in, you actually bike in, you actually run in. You swim on a 25 meter pool inside the track and then you bike around the outside of the running track and then you run around the inside of the running track. Uh, short and fast racing, knockout things. So they can only have, uh, I think it's 12 athletes per heat, two per lane, uh, and then you get knocked out, you go through into semifinals, you get knocked out again, you go into the final. And it was pretty exciting racing. It's all kind of a new concept, but it's also not at all a new concept. No, I mean, it's actually been done. I mean, the same course in Libin has been used a couple of times before for uh, European Cups. Um, so this is just the first World Cup that has been hosted at this venue and indoors. But also, way back in 1993, Bordeaux actually hosted a very similar format, a swimming pool made and built in the middle of a velodrome. Yeah, that was <laughs> actually interesting. We were watching the highlights of that, and because it's a velodrome and they're obviously boards, you can't get any water on the boards, otherwise someone's gonna oh, die. Yeah. So after they got up the swim, they actually had to completely towel off, like with a referee standing there watching you, making sure you were actually dry before you were allowed to get it. You didn't have to do that at this World Triathlon because uh, it was actually an indoor running track, so it was made out of tartan, so there was no slipping, although they were riding their bikes on tartan, which must be an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. anyway, uh, it was very entertaining to watch and uh, actually yeah i think it has quite a future it's exciting racing uh, look, i mean i've heard from a couple of people that were there on the ground and said the atmosphere was electric and yeah. really really they cool. sold something so i think i heard five thousand tickets over the wow. course of the weekend three thousand for the final so people wanted to watch it uh, and for good reason it was exciting so the women's race uh, came down to a final of most of the big names you would expect uh, vicky holland was disqualified from her semi-final and knocked out because uh, she didn't rack her bike correctly. Not exactly sure how she racked it incorrectly, but it wasn't their normal bike rack. She admits to it, said she should have known the rules. Uh, she also got sick after Hong Kong, which apparently lots of people mm. did. Apparently that was uh, quite a thing. But anyway, she, uh, she was taken out of it. But most of the big names were there on the women's side. And it came down to pretty much a sprint finish with Gwen Jorgensen actually surprising a few people. She was kind of off the back on that last bike leg, uh, slipped off the, the pack a little bit going around all those uh, sharp bends. And then uh, she managed to run her way all the way up onto Georgia Taylor Brown's shoulder going into that final, final kick for the line. She managed to get third. Uh, Georgia Taylor Brown in second with Laura Lindemann taking the win there uh, in fine style and actually definitely putting her name in the list of Olympic contenders, I think. She, yeah, uh, she's on fire. <laughs> yeah, um, and the men's side, also a very close finish, as you'd expect. Um, it was Vessel Torn that actually pushed ahead on that final lap and managed to hold on to that lead to take the win just ahead of Vincent Louis and then Kasper Stornes, also from Norway, taking third place there. Yeah, and uh, this is interesting. You see Vettel Thorne's <laughs> po post <laughs> afterwards. He did the whole thing with a broken toe. <laughs> the whole, all the races. <laughs> 
He broke it like really early in the day, I think. And yeah, he did all the races with a broken toe and won overall. Yeah, that is, that is very Hardcore. impressive. Yeah, very <laughs> Ouch. impressive. Ouch. Um, but yeah, we've got more racing coming up this weekend. Very big race. We've got Oceanside coming up and the field is stacked. Absolutely stacked. There's like something like 120 pros on the start line. Wow. 82 male pros, I think. Uh, yeah, absolutely stacked. It is the first of the Ironman Pro Series, which is the new series with $1.7 million in prize money at the end of the series. Uh, and you obviously get points for various... For, up to five Ironmans and 70.3s. Uh, and it's quite an exciting series and clearly the pros are on board with it because I uh, don't think Oceanside has ever been this stacked before. No, and we've also heard actually that um, some of the races are actually becoming oversubscribed. Now Ironman said that their pro series wouldn't be capped and there wouldn't be a limit. Um, maybe they weren't quite expecting this many athletes <laughs> to try and yeah. enter in. Yeah, we've heard that Texas, which is coming in a few weeks, is oversubscribed and people who want to get in uh, actually missed the entry deadline because they've closed the entries and said it's full despite the entry deadline not having happened yeah, uh, yeah. so it's a uh, obviously an issue it's a good kind of problem to have if you're iron man that you've created the series put extra prize money in and everybody wants to do it but you do kind of think they should have i mean it's this. not great for a particular couple of athletes that have missed out on texas who are best you know, top 20 in the world. And there are a lot of people on that start list who we may never have heard of. They've just fancied their chances and want to get stuck in with racing the best in the world, which is fair enough. Um, but there's a good 30 or so of them that yeah. we probably have never heard of. Whereas you've got the top 20 in the world not actually being able to race it. Also, one of the quirks of the Ironman series is that you get points for Ironman and you get points for 70.3s, but you get more points for Ironmans, as you'd kind of expect. But you can only count up to a maximum of three and there are only so many Ironmans in the actual series. So if you can't get into Texas, that does leave you almost at a disadvantage. You literally can't make up those points yeah. anywhere else. So it is a bit of an issue. Uh, we'll see how that all pans out towards the end of the ser series and the end of the season. Uh, but yeah, have it. it's a good problem to have for Ironman. Anyway, the first one of the series does happen this weekend. It's the 70.3, not an Ironman at Oceanside. Uh, and you can watch it live. You can watch it on their dedicated Ironman Pro Series website all over the world, except the USA and Canada, where you have to watch it on outside TV. So tune in for that, we'll definitely be watching it. Yep, yeah, um, also reminiscing a little bit more recently on your race in Samarkand. Um, oh yeah, last Uzbekistan, year. if you've never been to Uzbekistan, worth a, worth a visit. So yeah, entries are open for that one. It's in September, uh, the 7th and 8th, I think, or the 8th and 9th. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, definitely one worth going to. I really enjoyed my trip there. Maybe I'll go back. It looks stunning. Yeah, maybe you should. Um, does that mean you're going to do another triathlon this year? You're going to get some uh, cycling I'm, running? Well, I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Say what? Okay, time to take a look at some of the comments under our videos. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the one you guys commented on a lot was Mark in a wind tunnel wearing Speedos. Not that much comments on the actual speedos, but some interesting data that we found there was uh, that uh, Mark shoes from like 1980s were faster than his Bond shoes with the toe cover over them and dimples and everything. I did, on I did shed a tear or two. Yeah. After how long have you been wearing those and racing in them? And yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, moving swiftly along. Uh, Not just said, me, Jan Frodeno too. Yeah, we're, true. We're, Jan Frodeno yeah. wore those for all yeah. of his wins. Imagine how much faster you've been. Yeah, <laughs> with 1980s shoes. Uh, on the shoes, Alex. Uh, Ben Aiken. Ben Aiken said, On the shoes, Alex Dowsett recently did some testing on shoes and found lace shoes to be faster than custom-made TT shoes. Seemed like the laces act like a trip. Yeah. Well, yeah, Mark's 1980s one didn't even have laces no. on them. That's but so still, <laughs> they were faster. And yeah, Alex Dowsett's video is... I think he was in the wind tunnel roughly the same week as he was literally the yeah. same time, more or less, about a week before. And um, he, he, he has always worn... Bont shoes and exactly the same these zero shoes and um, yeah he also was a little bit upset to hear that his <laughs> mountain bike shoes were quicker shoes all that um, all that time in unrelated news Bont shoes now on sale <laughs> 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 joking okay and a, a driver moss a driver moss said my own research over 35 years showed that my old setup from 28 years ago was much faster than my current TT bike with deep aero wheels and at 62 years of age. <laughs> I think it may not be your setup. That's the issue there. But yeah, good point. 
<laughs> love it. Um, do keep the comments coming in under all our videos. Get stuck in and we reply to some of them as well. But that's it for the show this week. As I said, we've got this Killian Journey video coming up where I basically get to go for a run with my idol. Yeah, um, Mark, Mark drools all oh. over Killian Journey's shoes. <laughs> uh, yeah, stay tuned. Uh, that's coming very soon. Yeah, and also you can head over and watch that, that uh, wind tunnel video right now. Uh, not to see Mark in Speedos, but to see the comparison of the 1980s setup with the modern day setup significantly slower.